Mallory was a young woman who lived with her illness her whole life, who suffered immeasurably, but who always found the will to live happy. Her story is a testament to enduring parental love and determination and the healing power of memoir as medicine, inspiring all of us to live life as fully as possible in the face of the challenges we all face. Salt in My Soul, An Unfinished Life by Mallory Smith is a powerful, intimate, and inspiring portrait of a brave young woman living with chronic illness. Mallory understood that patient voices need to be amplified in order to improve health care, that the intersection of human behavior and nature is critical to environmental sustainability, and that love and friendship give life meaning. As Mallory's body deteriorated, she sharpened her mind, crystallized her thinking, and honed her writing skills. In her 2,500 pages of private journal entries, she created poetry out of her life experiences. Beautifully written, provocative, and peppered with insights, Salt in My Soul reminds us to follow Mallory's mantra and live happy. Her mother, Diane Shader Smith, is here with us to share Mallory's story. Diane has been a writer, speaker, publicist, and fundraiser for 30 years, and raising more than $5.5 million for basic science and cystic fibrosis research. Let's welcome Diane Shader Smith to the program. Welcome, Diane. Thank you for having me. Well, I watched the film Salt in My Soul, and not only do I want you to explain the film for all of my viewers and listeners, but where did the title come from? Well, I have to credit my sister with the title. Mallory had left 2,500 pages of writing, and we needed a title for the book. I worked with my sister and an editor to cull the best entries from 2,500 into 300. And actually I had a lovely woman in New York whose name is Claire Wachtel, who actually helped shape the arc. And then Random House published her memoir. The salt comes from the salt in the ocean that she used for healing. And cystic fibrosis is a disease that affects how salt is transported within your body, which as a result leads to mucus accumulating and becoming thick and sticky. Unlike the rest of us, if somebody coughs on you and we just cough it out or flush it out, it gets stuck into the lungs of CF patients. And it's that lack of salt movement that combined with her love of the ocean and how she used nature for healing that led to the title that my sister came up with. And it, it, yeah. it just worked. You know, I knew some things about cystic fibrosis, and I I knew it it is a disease in which a lot of people do not uh, recover from. They do die at a young age. I know that there are new therapies out there, but as as I was watching the documentary, I was surprised on the things that I didn't know about cystic fibrosis, and the salt that you brought up was was an eye-opener, and and we're going to get back to that, but... Mallory was diagnosed with CF at the age of three, correct? Yes. Now, did CF run in the family at all? Not that we knew of. And even though she was diagnosed at three, it's a disease that you're born with. So there were symptoms before she was three, but the doctors missed it. Really? Now, uh, you also had your son Micah tested, correct? Yes. And thank goodness Micah not only did not have the disease, but he wasn't a carrier. You have to get one gene from your mother and one gene from your father in order to have it. So which... uh, A lot of people people have one gene and not the other. So they could have a baby with somebody that would end up having CF, even though they don't have it. And that's what uh, happened. Both Mark and I had one gene each. Oh, so both of you had one gene each of the CF. Mm -hmm. Okay. So how old was Mallory when she started writing her journal about her life and her life experiences? Well, she started writing actually at the age of nine when we had this moment where she, after being compliant for so many years, came home one day and said she was not going to do treatment anymore. And she was very dramatic about it. And so we had to explain to her that the disease could be fatal and that she had to do treatments to save her life. And she slammed the door. She didn't speak to us for three days, but that's when she started writing. And it was first in you know, sort of immature childlike diaries, but then she moved it to a computer and locked it and password protected it. And that's why 
most of it was new to me when she passed away. So when uh, you opened up Mallory's journal for the very first time, what was your first reaction to reading her thoughts and listening to her voice? It was shocking because I was joined at the hip with her. We were really that mother-daughter duo, mostly because she didn't get the freedom of having complete independence as a teenager and young adult that most people do, but also because I learned how to make myself useful and you know, did things for her to allow her to spend more time with her friends. And that, so for example, if she was in college and got sick or was particularly busy with finals, I would fly up and do her treatments and help her so that she didn't have to do as much. But that what that did was that enabled me to get to really live her life with her. So I would say it wasn't the details of the day to day that were a surprise. It was the emotions that she felt, how she, how she processed what she had to deal with and how she kept so much of her pain and suffering private because she didn't want the world to pity her. And she just wanted to, in her words, live happy. And at the same time, she wanted to, what, appear as normal as possible to everyone around her because, you know, she made a very, um, a very profound statement in the documentary. And she understood that people would see her and in their mind from the external, she looked healthy from the outside. And then in a way she made the comment of that they were in denial of what her actual condition can lead to. Um, yes, that absolutely. was, that was a very profound statement and, uh, to have for her to have such wisdom and, and an in-depth insight at such a young age was very surprising to me. Was it surprising to you? Well, her Stanford professor, Sue McConnell, told me that she was one of the best writers she had seen at Stanford in her 20-year career. Her elementary school and junior high school and high school teachers all told me she was an amazing writer, and I had seen a lot of her work, so I knew it. But I think the reason that the book and the film are resonating is because she's able to take everyday experiences and write about them in a way that even though they affected her differently because she had a disease, were relevant to everybody. Because the truth is many people, especially now, are struggling with mental health challenges or people have hearing loss, irritable bowel syndrome, diabetes, the list goes on and on of both invisible and visible illnesses. And Mallory being able to sort of straddle the worlds, the sick and the well worlds, and her ability to articulate what that experience was like is what makes it so relatable. And even though so much of the story is tragic, what Mallory has done is inspire us with her resilience. And even when she's facing catastrophic consequences and outcomes, she always managed to keep a smile on her face. And as you'll see in the film, in every, you know, so many times she's just smiling and looking happy and experiencing great joy. And her, you know, her words, what's crazy is, she left 2,500 pages in her journal. So the book has 300 of them. Then the film kind of explores different themes and takes it in a different direction. The filmmakers did a brilliant job of bringing her to life. And then there's also some material that I have not yet published because I'm just rolling it out over time that still has not been seen. And there's just, it's just, she left a treasure trove and it's given me a path forward because when you parent a child with chronic illness and you're so joined at the hip, it's your reason for being. And in an instant they're gone, you have to find a path forward. And Mallory, she provided it for me with all the materials she left. Well, what I loved about the film was that as a viewer, I was able to see both sides, to live both sides along with you, Mallory's friends, her boyfriend, her father, but then on the other side of the spectrum to kind of slip into her shoes a bit to see what she was going through, what she was thinking, what she was feeling. And I loved the way the film was put together because you could follow along with her journey step by step, knowing that the end was not going to be good, but, uh, I want everyone out there who is watching 
uh, myself and, and Diane here, you need to see this film, Salt in My Soul, because we need to understand that when someone is sick and when we understand what, how, what Mallory went through, we can have more compassion and love for those who are struggling with their health. And what is the absolute message that you would like for this film to, to, to bring forth to everyone out there? Well, I wish it was as simple as one message. There's a few. There's a few things that the film does, I think. And there are sort of three parallel tracks. One is what it's like to live with invisible or visible illness, whether it's chronic or acute. One is the connection that Mallory draws about planetary health, which is sort of the formalized name for the intersection of human behavior and environmental outcomes. In Mallory's case, she draws parallels between human sickness, environmental erosion, but planetary health is that intersection. And then the third is the treatment that she received at the end of her life, which is called phage therapy, which has the potential to save millions of lives. And the World Health Organization has estimated that by 2050, if we don't do something to address the superbug crisis, one person every three seconds will die. There is a treatment that is working. Mallory's case proved efficacy. She was the first patient with cystic fibrosis to receive it. My husband had the idea to track down Stephanie Strathy, who's the woman who saved her own husband using this treatment. And then they worked with the Navy and a company called Adaptive Phage Therapeutics and labs all over the world to get this treatment that arrived too late to save Mallory. But we now know, I actually had a call this morning with the Yale researcher, Ben Chan, who is using phage therapy, having nothing to do with CF, but with people who receive prosthetics and then get infections and they use phage to get rid of the infections and otherwise they would have to have amputations. So there are all kinds of unbelievable outcomes, but because of financial disincentives, they weren't sure for a long time how to patent these living organisms called phages that attack resistant bacteria. They didn't really know how to study it or move forward because if people aren't gonna get paid for it, they're not gonna do it. And now they figured out a model to make it work. So the third theme in the film is the idea that there is this treatment out there that people need to know about. And Mallory, her story, her writing, her words, the way she was able to see these connections, it's entertaining at the same time, it's informative. And I think that's why people are really responding to the film. If it was just a tutorial, I don't think it would have resonated well, but she has a gift with words. I spoke to a New York Times bestselling author yesterday, Steve Silberman, who, read, who saw the film and he said she was a gifted writer and her words really should be transported into the ether. So that's what we're hoping the film will do because Mallory's voice is heard a lot in it. So I'm yeah. really grateful that you're allowing me to share the story. Oh, absolutely. Because I was so moved by it. And, and your husband, you know, <laughs> when he first found out about, about this bacterial uh, phage and, and he, and he said something that you just mentioned, in the very beginning, when he came across it, he was told they're not going to really pursue it because there's no money in it. That That's a big thing. angered me because it, it goes against the Hippocratic Oath. Okay. You were supposed to help people. Money's always the problem. But in medicine, you want something done, you've got to find a way to profit for it to move forward. And because of these things are considered natural, you can't patent things that are in nature. I know how that law works. Yep. So I was yep. amazed that towards when she did have the double lung transplant, and then she had that bacteria come back into those lungs. How in the world did you, were y'all able to get the phages into her at that time? It was a Herculean effort. And honestly, it's all documented in the film, so I don't want to give too much away, but it's really a gripping, gripping story. But a lot of people, UPMC is an institution, Dr. Joe Paluski, Dr. John DeCuna, transplant surgeon arranged how to get the phages. The United States Navy worked on it. They apparently were doing top secret research on bacteria that returning soldiers 
from Iraq were contracting. And so they worked on this case, this company, this small company called Adaptive Phage Therapeutics that is trying really hard to save lives. And now there's other companies, the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation just awarded a grant to a company that's gonna start working on phage therapy two days ago. And they gave $5 million and it's hard. We're trying to use the film to lobby the government to fund more research. The one thing I wanted to say is that we are fortunately, both Mark and I work, we have full-time jobs. And so we're able to donate hundred percent of our profits from the book and the film to research. That's how we intend to give back and to try to get this moving forward. I was so excited because I sent the trailer around and raised a hundred thousand dollars. And I was quickly told that a hundred thousand dollars is a lovely sum to make, but it does not move the needle in terms of clinical trials, but they need to fund compassionate case uses. So for example, Mallory was a compassionate case where she was going to die anyway. And what I understand now is those cases cost money. Somebody has to pay for them. They have to do an emergency approval from the FDA. The reason the FDA is willing to grant those approvals is because the person's going to die anyway. In Mallory's case, it came a little bit too late. There are other examples of patients who have been saved because it came earlier. But then what you do is you take the data that you learn from these compassionate cases, and then you apply them to the clinical setting and you do rigorous trials and that's how you bring things to market. So we are using the film to drive awareness for what's called antimicrobial resistance, which leads to superbugs, and then to phage therapy as a novel treatment that can help. And then Mallory's story, which has been the platform we've been able to use to raise money. And at the same time, simultaneously, bring the patient experience forward. Because one of the things that I say is every single healthcare system and hospital in this country touts patient-centered care, but you have to hear from the patient if you want to actually have really good care. Now, the New England Journal of Medicine just launched an ebook. It's called The Power of the Patient Voice. And so that's one of the ways we're using the film and Mallory's story and her book to let doctors and healthcare professionals hear what the patient is living with, what they're thinking and what they're feeling. And at the same time, it's great, as you said, for anybody who themselves has a, a situation or who loves someone who does. So there's just unbelievable information and hopefully it's told in a way that's engaging and entertaining. So people want to watch. It's not a, you know, a painful film to sit through. No, it's not painful at all, but there are so many things to learn from. If, if someone is dealing with that has a sick family member. I think they can draw strength from it. And as I watched the documentary, uh, Diane, one of the things that Mallory said stuck with me, and I still think about it. And she said, I want to ride through my disease with grace. Where did Mallory's strength and determination come from? Well, I adopted a mantra early on, and I said, no pity party. That was the way I wanted us to live. And we knew that Mallory's life would be short. We didn't know how short, but we did not allow anybody to treat Mallory as if she was sick. And when people would use the word sick, I would rip their head off and say, she's not sick, she has a condition. And of course, towards the end, when she was actually very, very sick, then I sort of relaxed a little bit of those standards. But for most of her life, she played three sports in high school. She was a varsity volleyball player, water polo player, and she was on the swim team. She played club volleyball at Stanford. And we used to say, if you were gonna visit the campus, you would either find Mallory in the pool, on the volleyball court, or in the hospital. Because in her lifetime, she had 67 hospitalizations and they ranged from weeks to months. So she was somebody who, if her life was going to have meaning, she had to figure out how to create it. And if she wanted to have friends, she didn't want anybody to feel sorry for her. She wanted to have boyfriends, which she did. She had a lovely boyfriend named Sean. She had one named Nick. She had Jack in the end. She dated other nice guys. So she actually inspires everyone who knew her and those who have come to know her through her book and those who will come to know her through the film to, as they say, carpe diem, seize the day. None of us None of us know how much time we have left. We could yeah. be hit by a car. We could have a heart attack. We could get a diagnosis in a week. Nobody knows. And so you really do 
have to just realize how lucky you are to be alive and how every single day is a gift. Well, let me now, ask you this, Diane, because I, she, within the documentary, uh, she worked on a book uh, with with another woman uh, that's in the in the film about yes. the native plants of California. And when that book was published, uh, what did that mean to Mallory? Well, it was so bittersweet as all of this journey has been. The book is called The Gottlieb Native Garden, A California Love Story. And there's a woman named Susan Gottlieb who more than 30 years ago, way before anybody understood the connection between the environment and human health, believed that native plants could save the world. And she started out converting her garden and ultimately teaching others and writing books and doing podcasts and educating sort of the world. She is one of the pioneers of this movement. And when the book came out, the plan was for Mallory and Susan to go together on tour and promote it. It was a publication of the National Wildlife Federation and there was so much interest in the environmental world. And then Mallory got really sick and she never ever got to do one appearance around that book. However, she was in the hospital and she saw that it was in the New York Times. She saw that it was in the Associated Press. She would hear about the events that I would stand in on her behalf and send her photos from. So I think it was a reminder to her that you can make a difference. And in fact, she writes, I used to think you had to do something big in order to make a difference. And now I realize you can make a difference in small ways and writing's an example. And she said that the job of the writer was to make other people understand something they might not otherwise be able to see or feel. And she did that with her words and with her audio recordings and with all the projects that she worked on. Well, where can everyone, all of my viewers, all of my listeners, where can they see the documentary Salt in My Soul? It's opening theatrically on January 21st, but that's in, you know, look, New York and LA, I think there's in New Jersey and in Florida, but for anybody else, it's going to be available through iTunes and Amazon. They can actually pre-order a copy now, which would be quite helpful to us because in order to get publicity for a small film, you have to really bang the drum loudly in order for people to hear it, but you can pre-order through a link and I would love to send the link to you and perhaps you can share it with your listeners and your oh, viewers. Oh, absolutely. We will get that out there. And ladies and gentlemen, when Salt in My Soul is available, I want you to watch it. This is something that all of us need to see. We need to support it. And there's so much with science that we need to support. But at the same time, there's a human element that we need to look at. So Salt in My Soul an Unfinished Life by Mallory Smith is a powerful, intimate, inspiring portrait of a very brave young woman living with chronic illness. Now, Mallory understood that patient voices need to be amplified in order to improve health care and that the intersection of human behavior and nature is critical to environmental sustainability and that love and friendship give life meaning. And as Mallory's body deteriorated, she sharpened her mind. She crystallized her thinking and honed her writing skills. And in her 2,500 pages of private journal entries, she created poetry out of her own life experiences. Beautifully written, provocative, peppered with insights, Salt in My Soul reminds us to follow Mallory's mantra and live happy. So when the film comes, you need to watch it. And watch it carefully and absorb it, and live it along with Mallory, her friends, and her family. We'll be right back.